Welcome to River Foursquare Church, where you are joining us online, and you can grab some friends, and you can have church no matter where you are, whether you're on your break from work, or you're at home, or you're at a cafe, you can grab friends, you guys can watch these videos, you can discuss the questions. If you'd like and subscribe this video in this channel, then you can be updated to every release that we have, and we would love to have you join us um, for our all-community gathering if you're in a local Seattle area, which is happening on May 20th at 6 p.m. at Grace Church in Federal Way. Uh, we come together for worship and communion and for just a time to celebrate what God's doing in all of our communities. And if you're part of the local area and you want to be in an in-person community, you can go to riverfoursquare.org and click on the Connect tab and learn more there. If you're part of River, thank you so much for continuing to support what God is doing here through your giving. You can do that by texting to 84321 or you can go to riverfoursquare.org org and click on the gift tab. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for today. Your presence is with us right now. We choose to recognize you're with us. Holy Spirit, you're in us. So be the one who teaches and leads as Jesus said you would and use our gifts and talents to illustrate what you want illustrated today in Jesus name. Amen. Last week, we Jesus, uh, you know, used the traditional title. Jesus uh, cleansed the temple. That was soap and water in a bucket. <laughs> no, that was soap and water in a bucket. He, he, there was some eviction notices happening in the temple, and because Jesus came looking for worship, and he didn't see worship. And worship is our definition. We were we were using last week is acknowledging who he is, and our relationship to him because of that, right? That's a very loaded statement. I don't know if you guys got that. That's a very complex statement. There's a lot of things going on there with that, in that phrase. It's not as simple. It, there's a lot of things going on there, which is, why I, which is why I used it. It's understanding or recognizing who he is and our relationship to him because of who he is. It's worship. And to serve Christ only costs one thing, right? Everything. It only costs one thing. It costs everything. It's living out this Galatians 2.20 for, uh, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God is looking for those who want to be in relationship with him. Jesus came to the temple that day looking for worshipers, looking for those who wanted to be in relationship with him. That's what he's expecting. So something for us to talk about in our uh, community groups. You want to ask this? Yeah. So how was your week? Did you take time to do what we talked about last week, that phone off, life off moments with Jesus, where you just put aside everything and you said, okay, God, it's just you and me. We're going to sit here. We're going to have a conversation. I'm going to talk to you. You're going to talk to me. You laid it all out and just took that focus time with him without multitasking and like cleaning the dishes or doing those things. Um, what was that like if you did? How did God show up in your life this week? What was it? What was going on? Talk about that.
there are moments in our lives where I think sometimes we can recognize the moment. We can have a clarity. There's a good word. We can have a clarity at the significance of the events that we are participating or the events that we are seeing. There's moments. Sometimes uh, it's it can be uh, maybe uh, a marriage or maybe a graduation. Maybe some of those significant moments that you can take a moment and stop what you're doing. Pull back and say, this is a significant moment moment and have clarity of like this is significant i understand the gravity of what is happening here there's moments we can have clarity uh, we can understand um that we become aware i remember the the moment i sat on your front porch and and you prayed for me a million years ago um when dinosaurs roamed the earth you were really really young you put too many reallys, which if you put that many reallys, you know, the opposite is. It also means we're really, really. Well, if anyway. you said we're alive with the dinosaurs, then you know, then yeah, that's pretty old. But yes, I prayed for you Those on the porch. Those raptors are real. Okay. Yes, I prayed for you on the porch. I rode them. Um, so in that moment, I had my eyes were closed and Rosanna had said, you know, open your eyes. And I said, no, because I had a clarity of thought. I had a clarity of moment that I knew if I did, everything would be now changed. I just, I just knew. I go, this is, this is one of those moments. I had a clarity. And I, like, I understand everything is going to change now. And like I can go through the rest of my life with my eyes closed and have it not changed. Yes, la, la, la. You can't see me, right? That's, that's what my concept. But I had a clarity of thought. Jesus, as we continue the story of cleansing the temple, is Jesus is trying to tell the Jews. He's trying to give them a clarity of thought. He goes, everything is about to change. Everything's going to about to change. Are you going to take a step back and see it? Are you going to have the uh, take a step back and have a clarity of thought, knowing what's going to take place? So here's where we pick up in the story that Jesus has just cleansed the temple, and uh, Jesus is saying everything's about ready to change. And so the Jewish leaders question him after you know after he does all this, and that's where we're going to pick up in John chapter two, verse. 18 to 25. So the Jews said to Jesus, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and he needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. So Jesus just finished flipping tables and chasing... Um Donkeys, oxen. not oxen, but oxen, sheep, and turtle doves out of the thing. So he doesn't really mention loosing the turtle doves. He says it, they told him to take them out. Yeah. So I don't know he why let them they take those special. out in cages, so. Interesting. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it was more easy. Maybe it was more convenient. I don't know. But he had just done that, and he has this uh, in, inner interaction with, 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 with the Jewish people in there and, and jesus makes a statement and goes this house of worship um will be destroyed three days later i'll rebuild it and the jewish leaders they're looking very linear linear that's it and concrete and they said jesus it's taken 46 years to build this temple Fun fact, it's not done yet. It takes another 30 years to complete it, right? So it's a 70 plus year building project going on. So it's already, they've already been building it for 46 years. So this is the, how grandiose construction is. And they're like, Jesus, this is crazy. You can't rebuild this thing in, in three days. This is, this is, a, this is crazy. And the author, the Apostle John, points out and he goes, well, Jesus wasn't actually talking about the building. He was talking about himself. He was talking about himself, that he was going to die. Three days later, rise from the dead, and that was going to change everything. That was going to upset the, 
the apple cart, that after that event, after Jesus was to be risen from the dead, that worship would change. That worship would change. That there'd be no more sacrifices needed. There'd be no more need for turtle doves, no more need for sheep, no more need for oxen, and you wouldn't be able to build a road or a settlement in Catan because you wouldn't have these things, right? Everything was going to change. Everything was was going to change. He was the final sacrifice. And that's what he's telling. He goes, this building, I'm going to destroy it. It will no longer be needed anymore. And three days later, I'm going to make a new house. I'm going to make it better. That the temple was going to be relocated. The temple was going to move. That his presence wouldn't be in a building. His presence would be in man. It'd be with every believer. You wouldn't be have, remember we talked about the, the three areas. May I'll put it back on the screen. We had the, the court of Gentiles, the court of women, the court of Israel, and the court of priests, and, the, and then the holy of holies. No more. Not the way it was going to be. There was nothing. Everybody, his presence was going to be with every single believer. That Jesus was changing the temple. He was going to do things differently. I, I really like this phrase. Uh, the first time I heard it a few weeks ago, I was like, man, that's a good phrase. And the phrase is this, that Jesus was hyper-localizing his presence. He wasn't just localizing it, as in coming to a geographic region. He was hyper-localizing. He was coming to an individual. He was coming to individuals. He was hyper-localizing his presence. From a building you had to go to, He was coming to a person to be with. Changed it. Changed it. And it starts with that, his resurrection, that once the price has been paid, the debt had of sin fulfilled, the temple would be rebuilt. The physical building would move and everything would change. Now let's go back to the original plan. The original plan. Adam and Eve in the garden, right? It always comes back to this. And the reason why is because we get a, a snippet and a snapshot a way we were designed, the way life was made to be. We get a snippet, and I wish there was more details, but we get a snippet, and we see part of that. That snippet we see is that, that Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, which says, And the Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day, and the man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. We learn a lot here. One thing as we learn is this. God was walking in the garden. That this was a normal occurrence. Because he, he came to hang out with them. Came to hang out with them. And it said Adam and Eve hid from God's presence. They hid from his presence. Because they had rebelled. They had sinned, that they had removed themselves from God's presence because of their guilt and their shame. But God came looking for relationship that day. He goes, where's Adam and Eve? I want to talk to them. Let's have a, let's, how was your day? Right? He wanted to have relationship. He wanted a one-on-one connection with people, but sin changed that. Adam and Eve hid themselves from his presence. And when that sin entered in, we were separated from his presence. I, and I think this, at least I, I think these things, when, when I read scripture and I look at this stuff, is when Adam and Eve sinned and chose to remove themselves from God's presence. Have you ever thought, who did it hurt more? Did it hurt man or did it hurt God? And I don't think there's a theological conclusion we can draw, okay? But understand, this was not without loss for God. Because this was his plan to be in relationship. He came that day looking for a relationship as he always did. Where are you? Where are you? It's actually recorded in Scripture. That's the first question he asks of man. He goes, where are you? Who did hurt more? Because it cost God something that day. God created man for relationship. 
and man chose not to have it. Man chose not to have it. But God wanted to give man another chance. He wanted to give them a second opportunity because he wanted to be with us and because we were made to be with him. He gave us a chance. What was the question? Yeah. So if you've said yes to that relationship with Jesus, you've invited him to be part of your life, you said you're in charge, let's hang out, let's do life together. Why did you make that decision? What was it about him and the relationship that drew you there and made you want to say yes and to kept this, you there. and kept you there to this new life? As Andrew said, you know, he made that choice on the porch and I prayed for him after he prayed and we prayed together and he knew life was going to be different and he came to that point for a reason. So what brought you to that point? How did that change? Um, I won't go into quite how that changed the trajectory of your life because we'll be here forever. But what brought you to that? What made you desire to say yes and pushed you over that little lip of edge of, okay, God, you're in charge now?
So what is this presence, right? There's words we use, and, and sometimes we say these words without really understanding what they mean. So when we understand words, it helps us to understand everything. So what is this presence? Now, we have to know this, that God is always with us. By definition, that he's God means he's omnipresent, which is everywhere, all at once, everywhere. I think I said everywhere twice, but you're with me. He's everywhere all the same time. By definition, he is. So that's not exactly what I'm talking about. That's not exactly what we're talking about here. But his presence is when his being becomes evident to you. His presence is when God's being, who he is, becomes evident and apparent to you. That who he is becomes tangible. I, was, I don't want to go down that road, but he becomes tangible. He becomes known by you and becomes known to you. He becomes very real very real. And we have to know that God's presence as a believer is with you right now. Right now. And when God's presence is with you right now, it is marked and is highlighted. I like that word highlighted um, because it reminds me of highlighters. I think that's the concept. Um, Always use liquid highlighters work way better. Um, But when you get that bright yellow line on the deal, it pops. It stands out. It, 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 it makes a, makes a mark. And so when God's, when we become aware of God's presence, it is highlighted and it is marked by certain things. And let's talk about a couple of those things. The first one it's marked by is, is, I'm going to use a word, and I don't like using the word. And the reason why is because we don't get the definition. We just word, well, there it is. It's a big word. It's marked by peace. Okay, let's talk about what peace is. I came up with my own definitions, right? Because I wanted to capture what is going on here with his presence. Because where there's presence, it's highlighted or marked by peace. His presence is when it be, his being becomes evident to you. Peace. Peace is the absence of things. I'm going to let that breathe for a second. Peace is the absence of things, mind, heart, circumstances, situations, becomes the absence of things and the overflowing of him in our lives. Think about it. when we experience peace, and, and actually we're going to break that down even more here, but that when we experience this peace is because when we, we, we choose not to let all of the things affect us, and we become aware of his presence because we've chosen not to let the things affect us. It's the absence of things, the overflowing of him. It, it's when the cares of everything fall away. They don't matter. They don't matter. And the the things of life get in pers- get put into perspective. I'm I'm a heavy P user. <laughs> it sounded bad. Oh, we got to keep going. When <laughs> It's funny, but actually it is that funny. Everyone settled down. Okay. Where was I? It's when the things get in proper perspective of eternity. When they get put in light of eternity and removed from the uh, appearance of the now. They get in perspective of eternity. That this life, this life seems so important, right? Because it's now because it's concrete, tangible, that everything seems so 
urgent and so important and so has to be done. And in the, in the span of our lifetime, maybe it's important. Maybe. But in the scope of forever, not so much. Not so much. But they feel so important to us. And peace is when the things of this life get put into proper perspective of eternity. Of eternity. His presence changes priorities. Why? Because they don't matter. They don't matter anymore. And when we become aware of God's being, his presence, our priorities shift to his priorities. And we see things that matter to him. That's relationship. And that peace we experience, remember all the definitions we use, is his presence. That sense that God is in control. And that we no longer have to be. And that's why Paul says in, in Philippians chapter 4, he's, he makes a statement. He goes, he goes, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And look at the condition and the peace of God, which surpasses all possible comprehension and understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Why does that work like that? Understand what's going on. I'm going to be very analytical, but it's, it's, it, it's blatant. When we choose to take those concerns before God, they come off of us and onto him. And therefore, we, don't, we are no longer concerned with them. Because to pray, to ask God to intervene is to turn over to him. When we turn these things over to him, our priorities shift from the now and our priorities shift to his and we become aware of his presence, of his being, the fact that he is with us and in us. Everything changes. And that's what Paul is saying. Jesus at the temple is saying, everything is going to change. My presence will no longer be a building. It'll be an individual. I'm going to change everything. His presence. What else is his presence marked by? So first it was marked by peace or highlighted. The second thing it was marked by is acceptance. Acceptance. Okay. Let's talk about this word here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, with God, we know our worth and our worth can't be questioned. Leave that right, right there. It can't be questioned by us, and it can't be questioned by others. When we're in his presence, when we become aware of who he is. Why? Well, God welcomed us into relationship. He made himself tangible and known to us. That in that moment that happened, that we're no longer the center of attention. We are not the focus. He is the focus. He is the center of attention. And in that moment, we lose sight of ourselves in his presence. And our worth is known because he is with us. One more time. Our worth is known because he is with us. Because why would God be with something that didn't matter? Why would God take up residence? Why would God change the location? Why would God hyper-localize himself if it didn't matter? It doesn't make sense. So there's an acceptance when we're aware of his presence. It's mar the acceptance, our acceptance is marked or his presence is marked by acceptance. That's what I meant to say. The fact that God shows up tells us we're accepted. That he chose you. John chapter 15, verse 16. 
You want to go with that one? Yep. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go out and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide or remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Jesus flat and goes, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Not only that, but I chose you that you'd have good results. And those results would last. You were chosen by him. Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. He says, he goes, do you not know that you're God's temple and that God's spirit dwells within you? Do you not know? Have you not? And that's the context, that, that voice inflection. That is Paul's connotation. That's just not me adding it. No, that's his connotation. He goes, do you not know? Have you not figured this out? That you're God's temple? That remember back in the scripture when Jesus said I was going to build the temple and rebuild back up again? That you are, he has hyper-localized himself in you by giving you his spirit. Do you not know? Have you not figured this out? Hello? Okay, I added that part. That's how I would have said it. Hello? We are the place he dwells. We need peace. We need acceptance. And we need to see life through his lives, through the, through the proper focus of eternity. His presence is with you. We just, we just have to stop and recognize it. So I'm going to let you ask that one too. All right. So we know that we're accepted. Like we all go, oh, yes, God accepts me as I am and he loves me and it's there. And we shake it off. And we shake it off. And then we sometimes sit in our little pity parties and go, I'm so miserable and nobody loves me and everybody hates me and I'm going to go eat worms. Right. We fight that. Worms. Isn't that what it says? Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm I'm going to go eat worms. There's a whole song about that. Anyway, my years in elementary school, preschool teaching. Um, (laughs) So how do you handle those times when you feel down in the dumps, when you're struggling to believe that you've been accepted by God, that he loves you, that he cares for you, that you are good enough to be the place where he dwells? How do you fight the shame? How do you fight that stuff? What do you do to get out of that moment and into something new? Talk about that.
So how do we dwell in his presence? His presence is with us. Okay, we've established that. But how do we dwell in it? I guess let me, let me, let me shape that a little bit. Let me define a little bit. What I mean by dwell is becoming aware of it, of him, it. That is, that is not the right term. I apologize. How do we become aware of him? How do we become aware of him? And there's a, there's a couple things. The first of these being is this, is, is we make a decision to be. We make a decision to be. A decision to be with him. Phone off, life off. It's almost as if I had a plan, right? We make this decision to be, to focus on him. We choose to turn life off. And I think the misconception is we think it takes hours. Oh, it's going to take hours to, to pray and be with Jesus. And I, I, just don't, I don't have the time for this. But that's simply not the case. That's simply not the case. James chapter 4, verse 8, and the first part of it, says, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. If you choose to be, he will be. Simple. Simple. That verse is a promise. If I draw near to you, you draw near to me. It's a moment-by-moment thing. You can stop right now and experience his presence Becoming aware of his being, knowing he is with you right now. You can do it when you're in a noisy stadium, and people are, are screaming. You could be in his presence right then. It doesn't matter. It's a decision to be. Jeremiah 29, 13, the first part of 14. It says this, he goes, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. And I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Once again, same promise in James. Same thing. James said it differently. He might have been quoting, meaning he might have had it in his head when he wrote it down. Same deal. If we draw near to God, he draws near to you. It's taking a moment, focusing on God, turning off life, saying, God, I want to be with you. And just be. I know for myself, sometimes it's, uh, it's, for myself, it starts with a deep breath. And what I mean by that is it's not that breathing is special. But what breathing does is slows you down. I operate at a speed that people don't operate at. I operate, I'm always in eighth, eighth gear. I, I operate way faster than most people. Way faster. Y'all need to catch up. Um, But for me, I have to take a breath. Why? Because I have to slow things down. I have to slow down because otherwise I'll keep going at 1,000 miles an hour. So for myself, it starts with um, breathing. I just breathe. I just take a deep breath. And I say, God, I want to be with you. I make a choice. And then 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 I be right? Not the right word, but you understand where I was going. Then, then I just am with him in that moment. And he communicates. And we, there's relationship there. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a minute. And <clears throat> what I want you guys to do is I don't want you to guys fiddle with your phones. I don't want you reading scriptures. This is not scripture reading time. Okay? This, when just being with God is not scripture reading time. It's being with him, okay? It'd be like this. It'd be like imagine going out with your friend or your wife or your significant husband or a significant husband, significant other, like there's more than one, significant other, and you're like, hey, let's go dinner to spend quality time, and you're sitting there, I'm, I'm, I'm reading my phone. I, you? I, 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 I'm going to read about you and your life. I'm looking at yeah, your Facebook feed. Yeah, I, I just I'm checking at, all the things I'm just on gonna, your Instagram. I just want to look at your, your, your I'm Instagram I'm watching your photos. TikTok videos while yeah. we're sitting together, yes. right? That's what I think is sometimes we do with God. It's like, uh, I'm sitting, good. I'm, what, I'm saying, what I'm saying is 
you know, it's good to read, but it's also good to be, <laughs> right? You know, we're reading scriptures about God. You have God in front of you. Ask him. Ask him. And so I don't want you to fidget around with your phone. I don't want you, you know, everyone, everyone has, everyone sitting in your chairs, everyone does a, you know, usually when these things happen, people do a, a seat shift, right? I understand seat, she, seat shifts. Do a seat shift now, everyone. Okay, great. We, we, we've, that's hard to say. I'm going to stop it, right? <laughs> I'm going to stop it. Um, but, you know, there's, do that. Do that now. And we're, we're going to take a minute. And whether that starts with a breath for you, I, I don't know. For me, it will. And be with him. Close your eyes and be with him. I'm sure some of you guys, that was easy. I'm sure some of you, it was hard. We need to be in his presence. And I know a lot of you, you ex his presence was there. What you did wasn't special. He was special, but what you did wasn't special. And what I mean by that is it didn't take any effort. It wasn't hard. You just stopped and recognized and acknowledged he was with you. And he's like, yeah, I've been here the whole time. I've been here the whole time. Remember, he's the still small voice. He's been with you the whole time. And we have to have to do that. And that leads us to the second point. So the first one is, is just to be the second one. We have to recognize him, recognize him. So oftentimes we experience God's presence in worship. When we come together in a corporate body or when we um, sing to God or uh, speak his praise to him and honor him with words and actions, worship. That oftentimes we're saying, that's where, you know, if we were to go around, when have you experienced God's presence? A lot, a large majority of people would say in worship. Okay. Why? Why is that the case? Because in worship, we acknowledge who he is. That's all it is. In worship, we acknowledge who it is. We give credit where credit is due. We honor and praise God for all he's done. That's what worship is. And when we do that, the focus shifts from us to him. So what do we experience? His presence. Because we, in those moments, we turn off life. Do you get it now? Are you, I, hope, I hope, hope clicks are happening here. I hope they're happening here. Wherever you go, he wants to be found by you. You are the temple he now dwells. And it starts with a shifting focus, recognizing him, coming to the realization that, yes, God, you are with me right now. Right now. And you slow down and know he is with you. Phone off, life off. Now in heaven, his presence is everywhere. There's a lot less distractions. So I've heard, not been there, right? There's a lot less distractions. 
And we know this, that one day our God is returning. And as a conquering king. And in those moments when he finally returns and, and, and everything, everything dishes out and the earth will be transformed. It will be consumed with fire and recreated again. And in that moment, God will literally set up a new city on earth. Scripture calls it a new Jerusalem, a.k.a. the new city of God. And Revelation describes that, and it's pretty fantastical. It really is just like, I can't imagine it. But the Apostle John, he describes something in Revelation chapter 21, verse 22 to 23. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. He himself is the light. Okay. That's, it seems poetic, and it is, but it's powerful. Did you catch what John said? What was the first line of that? There's no temple. Why not? Because he's hyper-localized himself now. He's hyper-localized himself now. Therefore, even in the future, he still doesn't need a temple. He's hyper-localized himself. And his presence is so apparent that John points out, there he goes, there's no sun, there's no stars, there's no moon, there's none. And he goes, because his presence itself is the light. Mind-blowing. Mind blowing. I can't fathom that. There's no temple there because there's no temple now because you are the temple. Do you not know? His presence is with you now. Do you not know? This is what Jesus is communicating. And John, he goes, in three days, I'm going to tear this baby, baby. I'm going to tear this baby down. Or, and I'm going to tear it down, and three days later, I'm going to rebuild it. Because it's not going to be a building. It's, I'm hyper-localizing myself. Watch this. Watch this. You might as well do this one, too. <laughs> so we just talked about how God is right here with us now. We just spent a minute sitting in his presence. We can say those words, God is with me right now. When you think about that, he's with you right now. How does that change your perspective on the things that you're facing in your life? How does that change how you view the world? How does that change how you do life? What does that look like to hear that phrase and say that phrase? God is with me right now. What do you do? How does that change you? How does that change your perspective?
Jesus changed everything. Told him he was going to change everything. I'm going to tear down this temple. I'm going to destroy it. Three days later, I'm, I'm building it back. God is no longer in a place built by hand, built by man. He's in a place built by himself. You. He's in you. He's placed himself in you, and he wants to be found by you. Look at Revelations chapter 3, verse 20, the Apostle John. Notice the same guy who wrote John and wrote the Revelations. Interesting. Is this. He says this. He goes, Behold, this is Jesus talking, I stand in the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in, have a meal with him, and he will have a meal with me. Big statement. What does it mean? Relationship. Jesus is saying, I want relationship. If you'll let me in, I'll have a relationship with you. And look what else he texts on. He goes, you will have a relationship with me. I will walk in the garden again. You are the temple. You are the place that I will choose to dwell and to be. I will be in you now. And it's opening that door daily. But we have to decide to be. We have to slow down. We have to be. <coughs> Excuse me. It's great to talk to God when you're driving. Cool. It's great to talk to God in the shower when you're Cool. But you're going to have to stop and be and make it one focus in addition to all that. And it's not anything that requires hours. Won't hurt. But it, take a minute. Take a minute three times a day. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? Whatever you want to do, right? Whatever it will be. Take those moments and to be. And then recognize he's with you. When you recognize he's there, acknowledge him. Honor him. Worship him. And when we do that, everything else falls away. It falls away. And you'll experience his peace. You'll know his acceptance. Relationship. It's his presence becoming aware of who he is in our lives. It's a real thing. It's a now thing. It's a required thing. We need it. Let's pray. Jesus, you're here. Thank you for being here. We slow down. Thank you, Lord, that you've chosen to take up residence in us. Help us to remember that fact. Help us to acknowledge you and help us to live our life in your presence everywhere we go. No matter what chaos happens around us, that we would be in your presence and know your peace because of it. In Jesus' name, amen.